Good evening or afternoon to all. My name is Kaveri Advani and I am the Program Officer of the Critical Language Scholarship Program and a proud alumna of Boren. Welcome to the first webinar of the National Security Strategy Webinar Series, Working in Diplomacy and Defense. This is the first webinar in a series that will spotlight careers in areas and regions highlighted in President Biden's National Security Strategy, featuring alumni from the Critical Language Scholarship Program and the Boren Awards. To kick off this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are, I am pleased to introduce our first speakers for opening remarks. Heidi Manley, Chief of USA Study Abroad, part of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, and Dr. Claire Bugheri, Director of the Defense Language and National Security Education Office at the Department of Defense. Ms. Manley serves as the lead for American student mobility within the State Department and oversees USA study abroad programs such as CLS, Gilman, and IDEAS. Dr. Bugheri directs the policy and programmatic matters regarding foreign language, culture, and regional expertise for Department of Defense personnel and has oversight over the Bourne Awards, as well as other DOD student programs such as Project Global Officer and Language Flagship. Heidi, please. Terrific. Thanks so much, Kaveri. And special thanks to all of our wonderful colleagues at the Defense Department for their cooperation on this series, as well as our terrific implementing partners at American Councils. Thank you also to each of our panelists for being with us today and for representing not only your federal agencies, but also as alumni of federal exchange programs. And thank you to each and every one of you for joining us to learn from these amazing panelists about working in diplomacy and defense. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Heidi Manley, and I have the great fortune to serve as the Chief of USA Study Abroad within the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, or ECA. A few quick words about ECA, which is part of the public diplomacy and public affairs function of the State Department, focused on building mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. We aim to reach this goal primarily through exchange programs, that allow US citizens to go overseas to be part of the cultures and communities around the world and for people around the world to come and be part of the US culture and communities. Over 55,000 people participate in our programs each year from high school students and professors to athletes and artists. Diversity is at the heart of what we do as we strive to ensure that the Americans we support represent our country's rich diversity as well as ensuring that the diverse cultures of other countries are represented here within the United States through our exchange programs. Next slide, please. I have worked in various roles at the State Department since joining in 2005, including my current role in overseeing a number of our US higher education programs, including the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program, and the Critical Language Scholarship or CLS program, which I am incredibly proud to have launched in 2006. At the State Department, we believe that our outstanding and diverse American students serve as citizen diplomats when they study abroad. These exchange programs are diplomacy, building connections among peoples to support a more peaceful and more democratic world. Next slide, please. Our CLS program is a key part of these efforts as it entirely focuses on supporting American undergraduate and graduate students who want to learn one of 13 critical languages and overseas locations where these languages are commonly spoken. The CLS program is a summer program that provides the equivalent of a year of intensive language study through classroom instruction, language partners, host families where available, and the development of a cultural understanding along with language. The vast majority of CLS participants study overseas, but we also offer virtual programs called CLS Spark in Arabic, Chinese, and Russian to US students who don't have access to these languages on their campuses. I wanna emphasize that the CLS program is open to everyone, no matter what field you study, your academic level, or the college or university that you attend. CLS alumni, along with alumni of the Gilman and U.S. Fulbright student programs, have non-competitive eligibility for up to three years to enter the federal service as an option and not as a requirement. And the good news is that the CLS application will open in early October for summer 2024, so you have time to learn more and hopefully apply. 
Also, if you are a U.S. undergraduate student who is a Pell Grant recipient looking to study abroad, the application period for our Gilman program is currently open with a deadline of October 5th. Next slide, please. Again, thank you all for joining us for the first of a four-part series. As Kaveri mentioned, the next three will focus on various aspects addressed within our national security strategy as outlined here. Thank you again, and back to you, Kaveri. Um, hello all, uh, hello again. I'm going to welcome Dr. Claire Bougueri. Dr. Claire Bougueri, please take the floor. Claire, you are muted. I am. It's uh, amazing. Um, thank you, Kaveri, uh, and thank you, Heidi. And again, I echo Heidi's uh, welcome to our alumni panelists and guests. I'm quite impressed with the number of people that are participating tonight. Um, I do not have slides, unfortunately. Um, I loved the Z, uh, the um, giraffe slide. Uh, where else in the department can you brief and have pictures of cute giraffes? Anyway, um, I serve as the Director of National Security Education Program, or NSEP, as part of our Defense um, Language and National Security Education Office. Among NSEP's initiatives, we have our born scholars and fellows um, who many of you here tonight have, um, have part partaken. Um, but we also run Project Global Officer, English for Heritage Language Speakers, or of course our fla uh, flagship programs and others. So it's uh, really a privilege for me to be here with you this evening. Tonight marks an important uh, start to a new collaboration between the Departments of Defense and State. Uh, for many years, our alumni, both born and the critical language scholarships have made uh, valuable contributions to our nation's security. And, and the programs are, are related, and some of you have even um, participated in both. In fact, I was in Indonesia uh, about two weeks ago visiting our university in Milan, and um, the, um, you know, the faculty there have taught both CLS and Boren, and in fact, um, we went to visit host families and the host families have been doing this for many years and have also hosted CLS and, and born scholars. So um, you, you all have walked similar paths, uh, if not exactly the same paths. Um, so it's just, I think having uh, webinars like this an event uh, where it gives alumni an opportunity to engage with both the departments uh, of state and, and defense is um, it's pretty exciting. So I think uh, uh, the discussions will be rich and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So the, the Born Awards, as many of you know, um, came about in 1991 with the signing of the David L. Born Act. Um, we celebrated our 30 year anniversary uh, just this past week. Um, yes, I know it's been 32 years, but signing legislation is not the same as executing a program. And it was actually 30 years ago where we awarded our first uh, Boren scholarships. Um, so the Borens um, who, who take advantage of this opportunity to go overseas and study a, a difficult language, a, something critical for our national security, um, they aspire to work for the government and they earn that opportunity. They owe us uh, 12 months on the completion of their um, their tour. And that's um, our job in Delencio is to assist with the with the uh, job search and um, and then help them track the time that they've uh, actually uh, worked for the government so that they can complete their obligation. And many borns go on to serve uh, long term careers. <laughs> need to tell you how important um, these skills are for the department and, and why David Boren, uh, back in 1991, uh, initiated this program. I mean, he looked around, he saw an aging workforce uh, and a dearth of um, language, uh, regional expertise, and, and culture skills, and thought that this would be a really good way to attract some bright, young, 
uh, talent into the department to be our future leaders. Um, and it's working. I um, The number that was given to me uh, last week when I was briefing at the um, award ceremony and, and our anniversary event, it's something like 19,000 awards, not just born, but um, NSEP awards have been issued uh, since the beginning of the program. So that's a, that's a big number and that's a big impact. And and it just shows that programs like CLS and Boren um, are are pretty foundational to our, our national security efforts and, and building that future uh, leadership capability. So our alumni are extremely impressive. Uh, when I meet uh, our students, when I go out and travel and talk to uh, not only students currently in the program, but alum, um, I am hopeful. It's, it show, I have complete faith that our, our nation is in good hands for the future. Um, and so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to the uh, enlightening and educational panel discussions this evening. Um, back to you, Kaveri. Thank you, Heidi and Claire, for your opening remarks. I just want to note that we just heard earlier today that we have seven CLS scholars who started in the Foreign Service A100 class in June. That is great and very timely news for the launch of this webinar series. I am now pleased to pass the floor to my State Department colleague and an alumna of the CLS and Boren programs, Erica Chuzano. Erica is a career Foreign Service officer who is currently serving as a member of the Secretary's policy planning staff. Erica is a proficient Arabic speaker and did her CLS in Oman and her Boren in Jordan. Hi, all right, good evening, good afternoon. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Great, all right. Um, thank you so much, Kaveri, for the kind introduction and for ECA team's leadership of US study abroad. The ECA team is providing life-changing opportunities for Americans to build people, people to connections and contributing in an enduring way to our national security. I've been asked here today to talk a little bit about the US national security strategy and then facilitate a conversation among foreign policy professionals about careers in diplomacy and defense. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Our partners at American Councils are managing the technical elements of the Zoom. So if you have technical questions, please drop a note in the chat. And ECA has also released a survey, which we hope that you can fill out during this webinar. I believe that's gonna get dropped in the chat as well. Also, we want this to be interactive. So we have a few questions teed up for our panelists to start, but we also wanna hear from you. So please drop your questions in the chat as we go. And uh, we would also welcome uh, your views on any uh, careers in diplomacy and defense that you'd like to pursue in the future. So welcome to drop that in the chat. With that, on to the national security strategy. President Biden's national security strategy lays out how the United States will advance our vital interests and pursue a free, open, prosperous, and secure world. The strategy is rooted in our national interests, which are to protect the security of the American people, expand economic opportunity, and defend democratic values at the heart of the American way of life. The national security strategy outlines two defining challenges of this decade. First, a lasting strategic competition with powers that layer authoritarian governance with a revisionist foreign policy and shared challenges like climate change, food insecurity, communicable, communicable diseases, which cross borders and require global cooperation. To meet this moment, we are investing in America's greatest strategic advantage, our unmatched network of allies and partners. We're revitalizing our historic alliances and partnerships like NATO, an alliance which is stronger and more united today than ever. And we're building new coalitions fit for purpose to tackle shared challenges. For example, like our global coalition to prevent illicit manufacturing and trafficking of synthetic drugs. We're also stepping up our leadership at the UN and other international fora to uphold foundational values such as territorial integrity, universal human rights, and a global economy that operates on a level playing field. We are not only revitalizing and reimagining America's partnerships abroad, but we're also investing here at home building networks at the subnational level, 
among business, civil society, citizens, and especially young leaders. The national security strategy breaks down the dividing line between foreign and domestic policy because our strength at home and abroad are inextricably linked and investing in our own democracy, our innovative power, and the strength of our people will help us shape a more free, open, prosperous, and secure world. People-to-people -people connections through U.S. government exchange programs are vital to this effort. It is great to see so many on this call interested in exchange programs and careers in diplomacy and defense. Our engagement today includes colleagues dialing in from across the United States. At one time, such an engagement might have only included those available locally here in the Washington, D.C. area, but this gathering demonstrates the power of building broad partnerships. Let's go ahead and start hearing from our panelists. I will turn it to each panelist to introduce themselves, share uh, some of their past experience, including uh, their participation in US government exchange programs. We can start with Robin, uh, then go to Kobe and Devin, and then we, you can turn it back to me. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Robin Murray. Um, I am a former CLS uh, participant. In the summer of 2017, I was in Xi'an for Chinese. Um, and then I was also a born fellow for the 25th, 2018, um, 2019 year in um, Kunming. After my year in Kunming, I uh, continued on studying in China um, at the um, inner, inner University Program for Chinese Language at Tsinghua University, which was, of course, um, in, uh, interrupted by a national pandemic, global pandemic. Um, after that time, I um, spent some time looking for work. It took me a little while, and I got to work um, with a company called Riverside Research out of Ohio, supporting the NASIC office. Um, my research there was Chinese-focused, obviously. Um, lots of language, lots of use, lots of very weird things I got to learn language-wise. Um, and from there, I after my contract year was completed, I did decide to roll off the contract, but have then just recently uh, received another role as a Chinese language analyst for Exovera, which is a national security think tank underneath SOSI International. Um, and that role starts here pretty soon for myself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kobe Vale. Um, I did CLS in the summer of 2021. Uh, it was a virtual Arabic program right in the middle of the pandemic. So it was a little bit different than some of the uh, programs past and future, but was still a really great and rich cultural experience. Um, I'm currently a bureau planner at the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs at the Department of State. And my role there is aligning budget with strategy. So uh, working on foreign assistance, trying to see how our budget and foreign assistance that we're support providing in the Middle East region can align with some of our highest strategic priorities, like those that were outlined in the national security strategy. And then I work with Congress, USAID, and some of our international partners to get that done. So it's a very exciting and dynamic environment. In terms of a career trajectory, I um, did CLS a little bit mid-career um, because I decided to do graduate school after I'd already worked for a couple of years. I Worked in re refugee resettlement for several years um, after getting uh, undergrad in Middle Eastern studies in Arabic, and then worked at, in international exchange. So some of these uh, uh, exchange and cultural affairs programs that have been mentioned this evening, another one called the IDLP program, where I brought international exchange visitors to the U.S. And then later, after my graduate degree, I helped um, organize the program nationally. And then since uh, about a year, I've been at the State Department. Uh, I would say just in terms of my CLS experience that one of the things that I think has really been informative in my career up to this point has just been the opportunity that CLS provides to uh, decenter us from ourselves, uh, to get out there and to learn about others, how other people think, what their desires are, what they believe. Um, at the end of the day, working in diplomacy is all about being able to understand and build relationships between communities, individuals, and countries. So. It's very critical. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Devin Hess. Uh, I was a, a born scholarship recipient in 2014 uh, to, st to study Russian. Uh, my original destination was uh, Russia uh, until the annexation of Crimea 
um, which then caused the program to move to Kazakhstan. And uh, that opportunity um, to move to Kazakhstan, a country that I had little familiarity with, uh, was such a profound, um, had such a profound impact on me, both personally and professionally. Now I work at the National Defense University. I am the Alumni Outreach and Engagement Program Manager, and I'll describe my duties in a little bit more detail here very shortly. But going back to my foreign experience, having gone to, when I, when I went to Kazakhstan, I, I knew very little uh, about the country. I, I knew that the country existed. I could find it on a map, but I didn't, I understood that they spoke Russian, but I didn't understand the complexity of their culture and society. And what was most important was the uh, cultural immersion that I got to experience during that year that was facilitated and enabled by the Foreign Scholarship. I got to live with the host family as part of my program where I got to live and breathe the society and culture that I was living in and interact and build personal relationships with, the, with my host family, uh, you know, go through the daily routines that they uh, went through in their daily lives, which gave me a deep uh, understanding and appreciation uh, for uh, the the country and the people of the country. And it's also enabled me to, to be better in my professional capacity now. Um, additionally, the cultural immersion was important, but also the uh, study of the language. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to master Russian, um, I did well, but I think the more profound effect was that that nine months of living in Kazakhstan with a, a host family that supported me. In terms of how it prepared me for my professional uh, career, I would say that it gave me the confidence and understanding of working with people from other cultures uh, that are very foreign from the ones that I was exposed to uh, growing up in uh, the central central part of the United States, Minnesota and Iowa. And in my current capacity, I work with uh, international students for about 20, 20 to five, 25 years into their career as national security professionals from foreign military, um, from foreign militaries and governments. And I enable their uh, understanding of the United States through domestic field study trips. And on the back end, I provide uh, I facilitate uh, providing opportunities to our alumni to continue to network with one another and learn from one another and connect with the university. So I just recently completed uh, executing a alumni program seminar in Czech Republic in which we had um, many countries, uh, partners and allies uh, get together to discuss key critical uh, security issues. And the most beneficial thing, uh, as I think was outlined, uh, outlined earlier, is hearing and understanding other people's perspectives. And that's what Boren set me up to do uh, and how it's enabled me to do the same thing within my current capacity. And I look forward to uh, taking questions from uh, the chat this evening. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Devin. Um, before we get into a couple of questions here, I'll just quickly also share my background. I'm a member of the Foreign Service. I've been in the service for about 12 and a half years. Um, I'm currently serving in the Secretary's Office for Policy and Planning. Um, in this office, we take a longer term strategic view of global trends and we uh, frame recommendations for the Secretary um, on critical U.S. foreign policy issues. Um, before that, I'd worked in the Office of Central African Affairs um, on our Great Lakes policy, and I've done a number of overseas tours um, in the Middle East and Africa um, covering political, uh, public affairs, and consular positions. Um, one of my overseas tours was as an Arabic language spokesperson for the State Department as the director of our Dubai Regional Media Hub. Um, so in that position, I um, had to uh, go on camera and um, explain U.S. foreign policy in Arabic, um, often in live uh, situations. And so my um, experience as an exchange student um, certainly prepared me for that. Um, and as Kaveri mentioned, I did a CLS in Oman and a Boren in Jordan. Um, 
Great. So let us uh, let us get to some questions. Um, we had a few that that came into us before uh, the day started, but we would really encourage um, folks to to drop more in the chat here. Um, the first question I want to put out there is um, what interests what interested you in working in diplomacy and or defense? Um, and let's let's put that to Kobe uh, first and then Robin. Uh, so I think the thing that interested me um, about diplomacy and defense is I'm fascinated by other people and other cultures. I, I was fascinated from a pretty young age and uh, ended up having an opportunity to live overseas as a teenager and um, met a lot of immigrants and migrants from around the world and just was wanting to learn more about what uh, this, you know, the beautiful world that we live in and so many peoples and cultures and diplomacy seemed like a key opportunity to participate in that kind of discussion, especially towards building um, you know, a better world for all of us to live in. And so I was drawn towards those kinds of opportunities that I could connect my community with others and in the process um, and support others around the world uh, to reaching their own aspirations. Um, I was quite different. I actually never really considered diplomacy much, although some of my background, I was a Peace Corps uh, volunteer. And so some of my first experiences overseas were actually in uh, more of a diplomatic role. But uh, I grew up in a small town, teeny tiny little town in Oklahoma. And all I wanted in the world was to see what else was out there and to serve while doing that. Um, I came from a family that was not a military family, but very much supported that. I found my way into an ROTC program at the University of Arkansas I thought, this is it. This is how I'm going to give back and use Chinese and really just, you know, be part of this mission. Um, but then I just couldn't figure out why everybody's yelling all the time. So I decided that maybe that wasn't really the, the role for me. Um, but as I got further into my studies and I realized that what I could give back was my ability to do research and do analysis. And I thought, I finally found my way in. So um Chinese was always something that I was interested in because it was challenging. And the more I learned about the Chinese culture and um, their history and how they interacted with um, the United States, I thought uh, it, it it never ceases to amaze me. And, and I've never been bored with it one day in my life. Um, all I want to do is do more and find better ways to take what that knowledge I have and apply it to something that matters. So that's that's the way I got into it. Great. Awesome. Thank you both. Um... So uh, I'll put this one to Devin. Um, what do you find uh, most challenging about the work that you do right now? And what do you find um, most um, interesting about it? Um, I'll start with the most interesting part. Well, the most interesting part is that I get to interact with folks from about 80 different countries um, every single year. Uh, and certainly from those countries uh, whose uh, background is affiliated with, with Russia and or they're, they're Russian speakers themselves. And so I get to interact uh, on a daily basis and develop personal relationships with those folks whose language, um, well, language uh, of theirs that I studied. Um, and so that's a really valuable uh, experience that I get to have in relation to what I did during my boring year and how I'm, what I'm doing within my current role. And what I find really interesting is the actually, the, the particular mission that I'm actually working in, which is offering opportunities to our allies and partners to learn alongside uh, U.S. officers, State Department students, other interagency student uh, uh, practitioners, um, and learning about how the national security strategy uh, uh, is developed, implemented, and becoming strategic leaders themselves uh, as they continue to uh, serve in their own um, uh, organizations uh, back home. And that's just such an interesting thing to be a part of. Uh, I certainly didn't know that this was part of the defense enterprise. Um, and so uh, it's an opportunity that was opened uh, to me by uh, participating in the Boren Scholarship Program. Challenging, I think challenging is uh, managing uh, all of the, uh, uh, the good projects that we have. I think one of the uh, challenges in working in government is that you often have uh, more to do than the resources to manage. And so within the uh, government space, you really learn to uh, identify how to prioritize what is most important and to slowly uh, change how the organization thinks about particular issues. And so the challenge is 
changing and convincing others to see issues in different ways and enabling policy to shift alongside it so that uh, not just a particular narrow part of the organization benefits from it, but a larger enterprise. And so it's a challenge that's both, uh, you know, uh, that we have to face every single day, at least I have to face every single day. But when you see uh, an evolved product, you are uh, just astounded at the impact that you've made. And so it can be really uh, uh, profound. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's let's also, if Kobe, if you want to uh, tackle that question as well. Yeah, so I think, what do I find the most interesting? Um, you know, it's a, so I work mostly on the Middle East and North Africa. It's a region of the world that's been a part of my life for many, many years now. And it is uh, fascinating, interesting. You know, there's never a dull moment in um, learning more about what's going on. Uh, understanding uh, the issues, the culture, um, opportunities. Um, I think that that makes the job endlessly exciting and interesting. Um, challenging part about the work is uh, working in diplomacy means you've got to come to an agreement with a lot of different people. So whether that's folks within the State Department or uh, you know working with Congress to help Congress better understand foreign assistance and the priorities that we have or our uh, partners with other agencies, that, that's a lot of work to make sure that we try to speak with one voice. So it can be a little bit challenging to kind of wait through that process as we you know, kind of have those conversations and figure out how we wanna talk about this and what's best for everyone, but uh, ultimately it helps uh, deliver something that's where it better represents all of us. Great, thank you. Um, so another question came up uh, in the chat that and, and others kind of submitted ahead of time along the lines of, you know, what can a student do now to prepare for a career in diplomacy and defense? Um, so I'd love to, to put that to all three of you because um, it has come up a number of times in, in different manifestations. We can start with Robin, um, then Kobe, then Devin. Um, and also maybe after you address that, it would be really interesting to hear from the three of you if there's anything in your background or your experience that may be um, sort of non-traditional in terms of preparation for diplomacy and defense. I think that there's a misperception that there's a certain kind of track that you need to follow or experiences that you need to have to get into careers in government. But in fact, um, in reality, uh, people coming with, with all kinds of experience and background um, can find opportunities here. Um, you know, just in my office, we have two colleagues. One is a scientist and another is a PhD historian. Um, so if there's anything maybe in what you've studied, um, work experience or something that you would say is, is not necessarily um, what one would expect could prepare you for a career in diplomacy um, or defense, but that you think would be interesting to share with the group. All right, over to you, Robin. Hi, great, thanks. Um, so as a student, work hard and build a skill set. Um, and if that means you're doing extra projects, if it means that you're taking your topic areas and, and steering them towards something specific. So when I was in grad school, um, I, was, I earned a master's degree in international political economy and economic, and, and then another one in economics. And in Every class that I could, if I had the opportunity, I would turn those topics and papers and discussions and presentations towards China. How was China affecting the Middle Eastern political economy situation? Um, how What was the current um, populist uh, explosion in the West? How was it affecting um, uh, China and, and news and the news outlets in China and how were the people talking about it. So all the opportunities I could to become as much of an expert as possible in that. Um, I also would highly suggest earning a, learning a technical skill. Um, I was told by a very smart person um, when I was looking for work, I spent eight long months looking for any job whatsoever. And then an additional six months looking for a job that would fulfill my born service. And I had a lot of calls and I talked to, um, his name was Michael Hirsch, and he was the head of the China practice at um, at, uh, at a Eurasia Group. And I was like, oh, I want to work for Eurasia Group. And they were never really interested in me, but it's okay. Um, but they, he talked to me, he said, listen, China is a career, is a country, not a career path. So you need to bring some other skill set other than your knowledge and your background in China. So um, luckily, I've had a lot of experience writing and synthesizing data. 
Um, and then I had been introduced to something called geographic information systems. And that is a really powerful tool you can use. And so I have in the last couple of years really thrown myself into learning that and, and, and earning that skill along with my analysis skill that I can all put towards China for a greater mission. Um, and as for my background, the, the second part of your question, I, I don't know. I feel like I've always kind of had a focus on um, being part of the big mission, you know, working for the national government. And, and I've, I've taken some, some side steps, but it's always come back to here. So um, my big entry into the world was, was the Peace Corps, and that is completely different than what we're doing, um, at least on, on the defense side of things. But it also helped me really understand what it's like to live among a people and realize that what I thought I knew about the world was completely wrong. And, um, and it made me more humble. And through that humility, I'm able to listen better and and have better responses to things and just do better research. Yeah, so I think for me, uh, some of the things that I would recommend to folks is um, you're talking to as many people as you can. Uh, just, you know, reach out for informational interviews, find folks on LinkedIn, email them at their work email if you can find it. Uh, you may not get responses from everybody, but most people are genuinely interested in helping others find pathways into the space and they will help you along and pass you on to their colleagues if you ask. Um, so I think being persistent in that is good. And the second piece I would say is that to, to be persistent. Um, a lot of applications uh, for jobs or uh, language study or scholarship programs, uh, they can be challenging the first go around and it's really helpful to reach out to others to have them review resumes and talk to people about hiring processes. I, I think that especially, you know, as being someone uh, with a federal job is that, you know, the federal hiring process can be sometimes challenging. And so not to give up after the first time and instead kind of just take a good look at what, what, you know, what can I, how can I improve my application and get some other folks to look at it. In terms of my background, um, I guess, you know, so being at state, I started at the State Department last year and uh, I'm uh, 35 years old. So that's a lot older than um, probably a lot of folks would think to get started. And so I spent a lot of time working in the nonprofit space and uh, doing a lot of other things along the way. I always knew I was interested in international affairs. It just took a while to get there. So um, don't be discouraged if the pathway, pathway to get where you want to go isn't exactly straight, but just keep those goals in mind and keep on pressing towards it. Hi, I would uh, I would echo what uh, Kobe and Robin have said in terms of recommendations, and I would just echo you know be, being persistent and being open to what the future may hold for you. Um, certainly identify the goals you want to achieve, but don't tie them to a specific organization or office uh, because with the federal government, federal budget changes, uh, priorities change, positions go away, positions are developed, and you simply don't know, especially when you're, uh, if you're in your, uh, your undergrad or even your graduate, you don't know what uh, the future is going to hold in a few years. I would also echo what Robin said in Take take uh, take your language study seriously, and uh, in terms of uh, seeing it as an uh, an asset, a value add to a prospective employer. That's how I viewed my uh, uh, my acquisition of Russian. I chose Russian because it was a difficult language. Um, I pursued it, and it really allowed me when I went to, to do my boron to really gain a deep understanding of the culture and history of the place that I was in. And that's enabled me to do my uh, job uh, even better now. And then in terms of my background, um, I don't think there's anything in particular that was, was unusual. I would just state my path was I graduated high school, went to the University of Wisconsin, had no idea what I wanted to do, started pursuing biology, hated chemistry, so switched out of that decided I uh, liked history, and then I thought, well, I should add a language, so I added an African language. Uh, but then I didn't think that was right, so I changed to Russian. And then I just pursued that. And uh, I had the intent of always joining the public service. I never knew that it would be defense necessarily. Uh, defense opened its doors to me uh, through the Boren Scholarship, and I've been here since. And uh, within my own uh, uh, path pathway here, 
I've grown to be uh, an individual, individual con contributor uh, to a, a program manager and a supervisor, which has really uh, helped me grow personally and professionally. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks to all three of you. Um, uh, just one point to add sort of from my background, um, I studied international relations and psychology. And so I think the IR background probably, um, you know, would be what, what one might imagine is a sort of traditional set of, um, you know, uh, uh, issue sets that would lead you to diplomacy and defense. Um, but psychology um, was tremendously uh, foundational for my work uh, as a foreign service officer. Um, and I wouldn't have necessarily expected that. Um, so I think, you know, be, uh, be open. Um, you, could, you could study a variety of, of fields and um, still find a place, um, you know, at, at the State Department, um, Defense Department, or, or other US agencies working on critical national security issues. Um, a related question that has come up um, and I'll turn this one to uh, Robin first and then uh, Devin. Um, what skills have been most important for you to cultivate in your career? We'll say in your, let's narrow this to in your career in government. Great, thank you. Um, so probably not what everybody would expect. Uh, soft skills, um, communication, not language communication, but the ability to communicate a thought, to uh, write it down, to make it fleshed out and help people understand what you're trying to say. And also the ability to ask questions, have a curiosity, what's going on? Why are we doing this? What are, you know, ask the questions you're allowed to ask um, and ask people, how have you done it? What, what was your experience with this? Get their feedback and it helps you, it, it's helped me be a more holistic um, professional. Um, I also say that um, I, confidence has been very helpful. Um, the Again, and that comes back to the kind of the question thing. I have the confidence to ask the question, have the confidence to not know. Um, you're not required to walk into every room and know every single thing um, that everyone else knows. I mean, if you do that, you're in probably the wrong room. You, you don't want that for yourself. Self. Uh, so being okay not knowing and still being able to walk in the room with your head high and know that you have the capability. Echo what Robin said in terms of the soft skills. It's so important, especially in, uh, in my career in government and specifically where I've been, is to work as a team, to leverage one another's strengths um, to enable the fulfillment of the mission or to fulfill or, or lead to execution uh, successfully a specific project. Uh, you certainly, as an individual, don't have all the answers. And so it's the ability to work with others, communicate a vision, identify goals, identify gaps, um, and do all of that in a holistic uh, way. Because again, you won't have all the answers. Um, the other aspect I would say is project management. So if you're currently pursuing studies, uh, add on those extracurriculars. Demonstrate that you're able to um, manage multiple things at once to even design something, create an, have an idea and implement that. That is so critical because it demonstrates creativity and creativity is definitely uh, a, a valuable skill uh, wherever you go, um, especially uh, within government. Because you often encounter challenges with, with policy, regulation, and you have a vision for how you want something to be done, and you have to work that up the chain of the command, chain of command uh, with your supervisor and identify how to accomplish something. And so your ability to work in ambiguity to get towards an end goal is extremely important within government, at least in my experience. Great, thanks to you both. Um, you know, uh, just one thing to add to that from my uh, current, um, you know, office where we do a lot of uh, strategic thinking. Um, I I had never really done much of that um, before I got to this office, and um, you know, I think there is a tremendous value in sort of taking a step back and looking at issues holistically. Um, I, I remember in a lot of previous assignments, I would just go straight to the tools of diplomacy. We say we have a problem. Here are the tools we need to 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 address that problem. But you know, in the office that I'm in now, we we really take a take a step back, look at the context, look at the assumptions. What are our actual objectives? 
you know, what are the tools and then what are the risks and trade-offs? I mean, it's, it's a whole process. Um, and I imagine that those of you who are in university right now are doing that. Um, so that is a skill that you're developing um, day to day um, and, and something worth, um, you know, developing going forward in pretty much any position. Um, there was a question that came in uh, specifically uh, for, for me about the foreign service test. So I'll just make a little interlude here and answer that question and I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, it says, how do you study for the foreign service um, exam? I believe that was the question, I can't find it now. Ah, how did you go about studying for the, the foreign service test? So um, this is my, my shameless plug here because we are, uh, absolutely um, excited to have as many wonderful people as possible, um, especially all of you on this call, apply to join the Foreign Service. Um, so I'm using some time here to talk about that. Um, you know, how I studied for the exam, I was actually doing my Boren in Amman, Jordan. Um, so I was living overseas uh, in the middle of that whole process. I remember at the time I went to the embassy um, and took uh, the first part of that exam. Um, to study for it, I read the news um, for a few years and just kept up with current affairs. Um, I actually uh, pulled out my old US, uh, AP US history study book. Um, I, I have no idea if that would be useful to you today, um, but it was tremendously useful at the time because I had already taken the class like a few years ago. Um, and it was a nice opportunity to re-up on my um, US history as it relates to foreign policy because a lot of the questions about our history related to, um, sorry, a lot of the questions about foreign policy related to US history. Um, and then the other thing that was useful to do to prepare is practice writing. So you have to do a lot of writing on the exam, you write essays, um, at some point in the process and during the oral assessment, you have to put together a, a little uh, policy memo very quickly um, that is clear and, um, you know, puts, puts your vision forward. So uh, the last thing I would suggest is um, there are lots of study groups out there where people get together and they share uh, tips and tricks. So that might be your first port of call because I took the exam many, many years ago and it's possible that the process has changed. So I hope that is helpful to you. Um, please apply. All right, let us shift gears uh, to a new question here. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, and I'll put this one to all three of you. Um, how, if at all, do your personal values impact the way you do your job? Um, let us go Kobe, Devin, and then Robin. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think the answer is yes. They impact my job every day. Um, so uh, in the role that I'm in, I, I engage with a lot of different partners and I have to represent the interests of my office to others. And um, I have to do so in a way that aligns with my values. So I think what that means to me is that, you know, there are a lot of different ways to engage in conversation and negotiation uh, and not all of them, I would say at least are ethical, right? And so um, when I am engaging in those types of conversations with others, like I try to be as transparent and clear, honest about our intentions and our interests as an office as possible, um, even when kind of the temptation can be a different direction. And I think that that's, at least for me, really critical on the values side is knowing that you can be in a job or a position where um, your values are driving you. And I think it's great that at least for me, that's that's the, the case with my role. So that's all I would say. Um, for me, um, so I have a, I've had a good mentor where I'm currently at, and he early on, uh, you know, gave me the advice, um, always uh, find the way to yes, if you can, within, uh, you know, moral and, and legal bounds. Um, so much of what our office does, a uh, significant portion of what our office does is support the international students and their families uh, while they're studying at the university. And sometimes we encounter really difficult issues uh, where we have um, policy or regulation which uh, limits what we can or cannot do. And I always work towards trying to help the human being on the other side, because that's what they are, just because there's differences in between 
uh, you know, their association with the university, their, so their immigration status or their, their, their visa status, et cetera, all of these different legal bounds that, 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 that um, bound the relationship. How can I work through the chain of command to uh, most appropriately handle a particular issue, which is going to have an impact on someone's individual um, life while they're here in the United States and impact their, their family um, and ultimately their experience in the United States. And so that's just something that I continue to carry forward um, uh, within my career uh, and uh, will continue to do so. so. Um, for me, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question because you know my work for the federal government is research. You know, I'm behind a computer screen a lot. And I'm looking up um, different articles and topics and I'm pulling down what I think is relevant and then going through that later and filtering out even more because you can't write, you know, a paper that covers every single thing on the internet on a topic. Um, and so um, the things that come to mind are, are things like integrity. Like you need to have integrity. Um, those are things that I care about. That's something very important to me. It's a, it's a key tenant of all the relationships I have. Um, and sometimes you have an idea of what the research, what, what you want the research to tell you. You have an idea of what you want to find out. Um, and you can't let that change what the information is telling you. You can't, like, you could choose as a researcher to ignore a whole subset of information um, so that you get the answer that you were thinking that you should have or that you think is the most important for the mission. Um, but that's not necessarily A, the case, and B, it's not, that doesn't, that doesn't um, you know, exude integrity. Um, also things like being thorough, being correct, um, you know, looking for things all the way to the end. Don't just stop at the surface, unless you're told we don't need a deep understanding, we need a surface understanding. The tasking will tell you. Um, but getting to the bottom of it as far as you can so you can give your superiors or the client or whoever you, this information ultimately goes to a full picture. Uh, because I mean, sometimes big decisions are made off of the smallest bit of information. Um, and so you just wanna make sure that as you're, progressing in your career and as you do these roles you're doing the best you can to be um correct truthful and thorough great thank 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 you all um great um so we got a question and i'm happy to to field this one but i also would welcome ideas um from any of you who this applies to um the question is can you explain uh the process of getting your family to come with you on missions, um, can you bring your family with you? Um, and I think this uh, speaks to, um, you know, a very real sort of um, uh, balancing act that all of us who would like to become foreign policy professionals, um, you know, may need to think about if we have a family um, and would like to spend a considerable amount of time overseas. And so I know that folks calling in right now may not be in that position just yet, um, but if, if it is something that you aspire to and you want to have a family, um, it is definitely a real question. Um, so I'd be happy to start with that, but maybe, um, you know, uh, Robin, Kobe, Devin, if either of you uh, have a family and have lived overseas with your family and want to jump in, uh, feel free if you do not, maybe just uh, let me know and then I will be the one to to take this one. I'm happy um, to share after you, Erica. Perfect. Okay. So, um, you know, being a member of the Foreign Service, uh, you spend about two thirds of your career overseas and you spend a third of your career in Washington. Um, even colleagues um, who are mostly based in Washington um, in the civil service at the State Department and maybe other colleagues can speak uh, about other agencies, but um, even, even folks who are based here for the majority of the time have an opportunity to do excursion tours and go overseas um, for two to three years at a time um, in various posts. And a lot of people um, take that opportunity and it's tremendously valuable. So um, oftentimes those of us uh, who have family, um, I'm married, I have two children, I have a four and a half year old boy and a one and a half year old boy. Um, I lived overseas uh, during, uh, right before my, my first was born and came back to the United States. Um, and then we all lived together overseas. And you know, pretty soon we're gonna be heading out with, uh, with, with the entire family. Um, and I, I would say that um, the U.S. government really values um, 
people from uh, all walks of life, all backgrounds, um, very much values diversity and inclusion, um, wants, uh, you know, really our service to represent um, the United States of America. Um, and, and really, uh, you know, and, and that means that uh, the service supports um, sending families, uh, people with families overseas. Um, oftentimes, you know, you can, you can take your family with you, um, your kids go to um, great schools, and, um, you know, we have increased opportunities for um, spouses of um, employees to find either work in the local economy um, or um, expedited, you know, opportunities at the embassy. Um, but it is it is understood that, you know, people who join the service, you come as your whole self um, and you are valued and, uh, you know, your family is supported. Um, it's not always easy. Um, it can be a difficult balancing act to manage two careers, especially if you're going overseas and transitioning every few years. Um, but it is something that is important and valued. And so for those of you who are thinking about a future in government service, um, you know, in, in USAID, state, uh, DOD, other agencies, commerce, um, where, where there are opportunities to go overseas for extended period of time and you want to bring your family, just know that that is supported um, and that, um, you know, every day, the, the, the government, the U.S. government is making it easier, um, you know, for, for families to, uh, to make their life overseas. So, Devin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Erica. So, uh, you heard from Erica on the diplomacy side, and I'll speak to the, the defense side, the DOD side, and those opportunities. Um, so, within my field, I'm specifically in security cooperation, um, and security cooperation is a pretty vast field within the Defense Department and offers many opportunities uh, to live across the United States, but also overseas. Um, I've had several colleagues from my office specifically uh, move on to assignments overseas, uh, and they're on two to seven year assignments. One is in Japan right now, one is uh, in Germany supporting Africa Command. And they have started families of their own in the United States and brought them over and are supported uh, by the schooling available uh, within the area that they're, that they're living. And so um, it is something that, uh, like Erica said, is supported uh, by the government. There are resources available um, in, uh, within the, the DOD to support those types of moves. I'll say that in general, you, you probably won't move as much if you're a civilian within the Department of Defense. If you certainly uh, choose to, to go the active duty military route, then you'll be living much more uh, like a, a foreign service officer and having to move uh, multiple times uh, in your career. Great, thank you, Devin. Um, we are uh, coming up towards the end of our time here. Um, so before we close, I hope we can cover two more questions. Um, the first, and I'll, I'll ask all three of you to, to cover this. Um, the first one is, um, which I love here, what is the most beautiful thing you encountered while on your study abroad trip. Um, I think one of the most amazing um, parts of being an exchange student is all of the experiences that you have and, and just the memories that you create and the connections that you forge um, that you maintain long after your study abroad experience. And I think everyone here should probably have a story that they, that they can share. Um, and then the second question, which I'll, which I'll just you know, give our panelists time to think about what is one key piece of advice that you would like to share with the group? Um, so let's go ahead and start with the beautiful study abroad story. Um, if we could go uh, with with Robin first and then we'll do Kobe and Devin. Goodness, start with me. There's so many. Um things to talk about. Gosh. Uh, so um, I guess the one I could land on is I did a lot of solo travel when I was overseas. My husband was actually in um, China with me when we were in Kunming for the Bourne Fellowship, um, but he had to work because somebody had to put food on the table. Um, and so I got to go and really use my language skills and, and, and dig into things. So I went to a very remote area in, in Sichuan province um, and um, I'd take a flight and dropped us onto like the third most highly elevated uh, commercial airport in the world. And you get out of the plane, you immediately want to throw up because you didn't get time to get used to the 
um, the, the atmosphere and everything. And so um, on the bus down from the airport into the community, and I was out there to see this incredible national park called Daochang Yading. If you ever get the opportunity, look it up, Google that. It's incredibly beautiful. Um, and on the bus down, I ended up chatting with these people um, on the, and we just, what are you doing? Why are you here? Because, you know, I'm a lone foreign traveler in China, an area that most foreigners don't go to. Um, and I actually speak the Chinese language. And so it's it's an opportunity for some people to communicate with a foreigner they, that they would never have. Um, and I had nowhere I was going to stay that. That night didn't know how to get to the place I was just kind of winging it and these guys stayed with me they helped me find a room we had dinner together we went to the park together and we just had these really cool conversations about their background why they were there how I got here um and and that was some of the best parts um was just these weird conversations I'd have with random people and I've been there are more than one story of like that where you just go and people are welcoming and open and they want you to try the language and they want to try to get to know you. And, um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. That is a, a wonderful, fun thing about seeing the world. And it really chases a lot of the fears you may have about the world away. Um, I grew up in a place where everyone's a little bit fearful about what else is out there. And I just couldn't wait to jump in and um, I was rewarded by it. Um, and uh, it's, it's something I'm very thankful for. I think that's an awesome story. And it's uh, hard to really pick one thing. Um, there's so many different like things that I could think about or throw out. Um, one opportunity I had, I was living in Istanbul, Turkey for a couple of years and visited the southeast portion of the country where there's a big mix of different cultures there. Um, in addition to Arabic, I also speak Turkish. And so I was on a bus uh, to a small town in southeast Turkey called Mardin, which is a very ancient city um made out of sandstone it looks like something out of a movie so you know the setting was obviously beautiful but I met up with a friend of a friend there um and I it seemed like I was in a, a different world but hadn't met this person before uh, but they were a friend of someone in Istanbul and immediately you know I got there and they they took my arm and we started just walking down the street uh chatting as if we had known each other for you know 10 15 forever basically and uh, it was just like a, a great like realization of like, you know, the, the shared values, shared desires that we have as human beings um, and that you know, our ability to connect with each other across cultures. And uh, so that was a particularly poignant moment. Thanks. I just echo what Kobe and uh, Robin have both said, which is there's so many beautiful moments along the way, especially when you're speaking the language um, uh, uh, with with native speakers and they're just overjoyed that you are able to speak with them and share um, your story, share your background. I had many moments in taxis on walks around uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan and uh, various other cities I went on or sitting on a old Soviet era train uh, going across the country and having um, uh, train mates uh, from Kazakhstan sitting there with me and just sharing those moments, having tea, looking out the window and just seeing the flat step for uh, tens of miles. And those were sprinkled throughout Kazakhstan. In terms of the second question, um, the recommendations, get out your comfort zone and speak, speak, speak um, to the, no matter how broken uh, your, your language skills may be in the moment, you can always correct those later and in individual st study sessions or with your tutor uh, or in the class sessions or whatever, um, because it's those interactions that are going to stay with you uh, for a lifetime. And you also don't know what the impact you're having uh, on that other person that you're, you're conversing with. Great. Thank you, Devin. All right. Um, so let's let's leave people with with a key piece of advice here. Um, Maybe we'll we'll go in reverse order now. We'll start we'll start with Devin, then Kobe, then Robin. Um, what uh, key piece of advice uh, would you like to leave people with um, as we close up? I think uh, I'll go to some some of the questions I saw here in the chat and what people have asked is, you know, how do I get into the federal government? Is there a specific way? How do I do X Y Z? Um, like I mentioned at the the top. Uh, be open, um, apply yourself, know your interests, and something will be available. And leverage the connections. I think Kobe was the one saying that 
hey, just reach out to people for informational interviews. You don't know what the opportunities are out there. I've been in the government for almost seven years. I still don't know all the opportunities that 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 uh, lay ahead. Uh, and so I myself, uh, in my own career, and trying to figure out where 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 do I go uh, from here five ten years from now. And so you just have to continue to develop relationships and connections with folks um, as you navigate your career uh, forward, and just know what your true passions are and stick to those, and see if you can match those with your professional ambitions as well. I think I want to echo one of the things that Devin just said there about relationships. Um, at least for me, my career professionally, both as well as personally, relationships really are the key. Whether it's uh, informational, uh, giving information or helping you build skills towards like applying for jobs, you just don't know what's out there. Um, and so talking to as many people as possible and trying to give back to, you know, when, when folks are, you know, value, give you their time, like, you know, see if there's anything that you can do to in return. So that's not purely transactional, that you can show an interest in others and their careers and their development. And that's how you're going to really build a network that's, you know, you'll be giving forward and you'll also be receiving. And uh, I think that'll open doors and uh, uh, other pieces, like, like uh, Devin said, to apply widely, you know, you just don't know, like what you're going to, be interested in there's so many different opportunities um i get to uh, throw things out there and you know apply to different things um i i want to mention again one more time um your area of interest your area of focus is that's what it is interest and focus it's not a skill set you have to bring something to the table that utilizes that interest um you can't just be the person that knows about the area you have to have something behind it. Um, and um, when it comes in terms of finding a job, goodness, it was so difficult for me uh, with COVID going on and I'm not from the DC area and I had no, so I was living in Oklahoma trying to apply for these jobs. Um, as, as, as you know, both my fellow panelists said, apply everywhere on anything that will get you the skill set. For me, the number one goal was get a job that used Chinese so that I could actually use the language I worked so hard to learn. And that will um, that requires a security clearance so that I can earn one because that that's been my ticket. Um, to my other roles was earning these security clearances that helps me stay in the field and um, gets to where I want to go, which then opens up more opportunities. So I didn't love the subject matter of my first job. Um, it was very, very niche, very specific and not something I was specifically interested in. However, that opportunity, that year of hard work, I learned so much. I did, I did the, my, the best I could for the contract knowing how important the work could be. Um, and now I'm in a, a similar role that has a more varied subject matter that um, supports outside research that has um, a, a more than one single client. Um, so I'm able to dig into more different things um, and become an ex a, 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 a secondary expert in something else. So um, don't limit yourself to what you think the perfect best role is because it doesn't exist. Um, you earn your way to those roles and you find your way there because you really honestly don't know what you're going to like right now because you have, you have to do the job first um, and that's okay. Thank you. Um, great. Well, this uh, thanks so much to our wonderful panelists. I have learned a lot from all of you. Um, hope those on the call um, as well. And please, um, if we didn't get to your question uh, today, um, we can um, hopefully follow up um, if folks still have questions. And I know um, ECA and American Councils are dropping information in about our programs. Um, thanks a lot for joining us. I'll turn it back to Kaveri to close us out. Hi. Hi, everyone. Just want to give a huge thanks to all the panelists and to Erica for moderating. I feel like I also learned so much. It was very, it was wonderful hearing all your insights and your journeys. Um, and it was really great. Um, I just want to thank everyone here for spending their evening with us. Um, as Heidi mentioned, this is the first of four series we're going to be doing uh, throughout this academic year, three more uh, covering more region specific versus uh, this one, which was diplomacy and defense. So hopefully all of you will also be able to attend that webinar and continue uh, learning about these careers and opportunities, as well as the CLS and BORN programs. So thank you for attending. <laughs>